So certification, what is it? Um, why do we do it? Do I need to do it? Um, so just, just to start out, if you don't know what certification is, so maybe you are just coming to the industry, you've never heard of the word before, don't know what we're talking about. You might be young, you might be, you know, retiring, or you might be whatever. It doesn't matter. If you don't, let me just talk about this word for a second. So certification is the act of formally proving your skills and knowledge through tests and time demonstrations. So it's a way for you to have somebody else say, this person knows what they're doing. Um, and a lot of occupations require it. Um, and some do not. In some professions, getting a certification is is a good thing, and in other cases, it actually can be a bad thing. And we're going to talk about why. Let's first start with a diagram, uh, a picture I made uh, some time ago to uh, whoopsie to talk about this. This. A lot of this stuff, the question about certification, and we'll, we'll get into some authorities on this, um, but the question on certification is fundamentally linked to uh, how specific your skill set is and how much you depend on trust, reputation, art. Uh, and so the spectrum is pretty obvious. It's pretty intuitive if you think about it. There are things in life, surgeons, electricians, doctors, airline pilots, aircraft traffic controllers, people like that, who, yeah, we, as a society, we agree you need to have these skills and they need to be like this and they need to be measured in this way. And so, and, and for our safety, we make sure that CPR, lifeguards, drivers, even drivers, right? You know, people joke all the time that there's no license required to be a, a parent, but there is to be a driver. <laughs> you know, but, um, but licenses, um, um, you know, degrees, certifications, they're all different variations of validating your skill set. And that is critical for society. You can't have it without that. So, and then over here we have the, the demonstrative performance, reputation, and portfolio things, which are, these can't really be measured the measurement is is what you have done and the trust you have established. So CEOs, senior executives, childcare providers, actors, they have a body of work. They have, you know, a CV full of successes, uh, sculptors, professional mentors, you know, can they be trusted? Show me what they've done. And over here, grouped over here, are software developers, project managers, race car drivers, game developers, lawn care professionals, carpenters. So, you know, learn to be a carpenter. Don't learn to be a hammer user, right? So that's not a thing, right? People, people don't have careers as hammer users, certified hammer user. No, they're carpenters, right? So... We, we need to keep track of that. Hairstylists. Hairstylists are kind of close to the middle too, right? You have them, they do have trust and stuff like that, but they also have to certify. This person knows how to cut hair without killing people and without making them look like monsters. <laughs> okay. You know, um, my sister's a hairstylist. Hi, Amy, if you're out there. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that's this is how it goes. And the tough part about any career, so this is not how, you know, why should I get certified in tech? This is why should I certify, period. But we're now going to move over to tech. So the answer is you should certify if you feel like, or if society feels like, you need to be certified to prove your skills. And if you don't, you should stick with producing output and building trust. And that means in the case of software developers, putting stuff on GitHub, you know, participating in open source projects, that's building trust. They want to see you can work with a team. You need to do everything in your power to build trust, reputation, and portfolio. And the truth is you kind of need some of this stuff as a surgeon. You know, you need to show, hey, this this surgeon is, has has been really great. He's done all of these amazing things. But, but, you know, he has to certify with the medical board and hold his license and all that. So there is some crossover, of course, but, um, but that's tough. Um, and by the way, if there is, when there is crossover, sometimes it makes sense for you just to lean towards a certification. For example, um, 
as in fact, actually, um, as our friend here says, it sucks that many certs are very expensive. Wait, wait, let me go to the other one. If certs are worth it or not, all depends on your situation. If you're already in the industry and you have contracts, you can always get a new job. But if you're trying to get in, nobody will even look at you if you don't have anything to show. So I think that's key. I like those words. Anything to show. In some cases, if you're trying to become a computer technician, you know, getting an A plus certification makes sense. If you have a lot of experience already as a computer technician uh, and you have that on your resume that shows you're being trusted, then you might not need to get the certification, right? So, so the stuff that's on the light end of certification over here, there are some things that no matter how much experience you have, such as like CISSP, you know, which is a, uh, you have to get that renewed every three years or an EMT, they have to certify every year and they ain't going away. Thank God. But some of the, as this stuff approaches the middle, you have more of a choice. You know, do I, do I get certified as a hairstylist? Man, I got a big following. You know, I got a lot of people who trust me. And so you can depend on your trust as opposed to some certificate because you're not, you're not building a community. And sometimes the certificate initially can buy you the trust. It's like, well, I don't know who they are, but I'm going to trust them. This is why word of mouth is so importable, important in, in pretty much every industry. So my entire business here is, is word of mouth. Very, very little marketing. I would put myself over here with professional mentors. You know, I am not a certified teacher and I make sure that's very clear. That's why I don't, I call myself a community as opposed to a school. If you use the word school or teacher or things like that, you've, you know, you're invoking all kinds of societal protections about what that means. And that's fine. That's the way society should be. But my goal is to be, is to work for you. You're the boss, you know. I'm not a teacher. I'm, I work for you. I'm your helper. You tell me what to do. Okay. So let, let's now back this up with a little bit more than just Mr. Rob's opinion. I think a lot of this is intuitive though. Now let's take one little comment here before I move on. It sucks that many certs are very expensive, especially in the tech world. Make it, it makes it even more difficult to get them if you don't already have a well-paying job at the base. And I think I'm going to come back to that comment because this is part of a conversation about the racket which is certification. And I'll, I'll, I'll end with that. So if you stay tuned and we'll talk about that near the end, um, that including how CompTIA is now lobbying for people to not be able to repair their own devices uh, because they want to force you to take their tests and pay their money. So this is obviously a problem for society and we need to think about this. Um, certification. So let's talk about the negative aspects of certification at the end. So we've covered what certification means and generally why you might lean toward getting one. Let's now talk about some, I want to bring in some other experts who've talked about this question on Quora that I found some time ago. And then um, I want to return, and this is going to be more than 15 minutes, but we're going to return to uh, when, what is wrong with the certification system, even though, but why we have to still use it. So next. So, um, here, here uh, the author of Cracking the Coding Interview, this is considered the Bible of, of passing your whiteboard interviews, which I will talk about and I think are, I think are unethical, if not illegal. It, it doesn't matter. They're still a thing in Silicon Valley if you want a job there. I would never work for a company that requires a whiteboard interview, and I don't recommend you work there either. But if you want to prepare for one, this is the Bible. <laughs> and Gail, who made it, was a hiring manager. Um, we're going to meet her next. Um on, she was on Quora. I, I, I have a little problem with the fact that she produces a new version of this in paper every year. Uh, I wish that that weren't the case. I wish there was an alternative. It seems like a little bit of a money grab to me, Gail. Um, so anyway, um, and I'm going to go to uh, the score question, which um, I thought really, really well dealt with the question. I was actually very happy I could find it again, having not looked for it in probably three years. But it's still there, and I recommend you read the whole thing. Um, and here it is at the top. It's, it's core.com. Are certifications for software engineers worth it? And this is a really, really perfect question because, um, you know, spoiler alert, I'll tell you, the conclusion at the end is largely about the word software engineers or the two words software engineers. And so there's a little bit of a disagreement. It's not heated by any means in here about whether you should get a certification or not. And ultimately the conclusion, I'll jump ahead, is that if you uh, are indeed basically, you know, doing what I was talking about, if you are, if you're one of these people, an engineer, a network administrator, or a software engineer in the sense that I am making system software, which is what a gentleman from Microsoft actually mentions, um, then yeah, that sounds like a reasonable thing. If you are a Java developer, 
Hell no. In fact, Gail Solstafar, I'm going to use her words, which are very strong. In fact, it was stronger than I would have, I would have said. It actually shocked me. That's why I'm so interested in this. So first of all, Gail is somebody uh, who coached. She was apparently one of the hiring people at, um, at the higher end companies for a while. I, I believe Google actually. So she says, the elite software companies, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, etc., are generally not neutral about certifications for software energy engineers. They, they're actually negative. I have a feeling that she, that she um, changed that word, to tell you the truth. Um, at one point, no, it says it was 2013. I thought she had pejorative in there at one point. But anyway, so they view it negatively. Yes, that's right. If you have a certification and you're applying for one of these companies and don't list your certification on your resume. And I, I'm not going to read all of her words here, but I will say the reason is that the first paragraph is that while certifications demonstrate some degree of knowledge, that's not what those elite companies are looking for. They don't really care about what you know. They assume that if you're smart and know the basics of computer science, you'll be able to learn whatever knowledge is missing. A certification, however, suggests that you do care about knowledge over improving your actual skills. That is so important. And this is coming from someone who was directly responsible for hiring at Google. So, you know, moreover, more importantly, however, the types of people who get certifications tend to be the people, tend not to be the right, right caliber of engineer. And, and then this is, this is a little controversial. I, for example, have never considered getting a certification and nor have any of the coders I know at these companies. I, that immediately throws into question her, her ability as a coder. Thank you for the follow. Uh, if if I want to learn more, I'm going to focus on taking classes on Coursera and building my own stuff. I might even try Top Coder, blah, blah, blah. And I'm going to memorize Java facts so that I can show them that I've memorized the facts. I wouldn't do that because I know that I know that no employer I want to work for would care about that. Yes, this is all circular. I recognize that. But basically, she she's saying that the higher end people who hire, the people who are looking for good people are automatically going to look for people who understand that certificate that the best way to demonstrate your skills is to produce content to produce uh you know trust by participating in an open source project etc doing your top tail competition stuff like that if you fill your resume, if you stuff your resume with certificates and you submit them, in her opinion, to Google and you know, Microsoft and Amazon, they're going to they're gonna go, why does he feel or she feel like they have to lean on these certificates so much? I mean, shouldn't they, shouldn't they be, shouldn't there be like a body of their work already? Shouldn't they already be like well-known in the industry? I mean, if they're senior enough, why are they messing with these certificates? Oh, I see. They were like way, way, way long ago when they were first breaking into the industry. Oh, well, that makes sense. Because I'm 15 and I, I want a job as a Linux system administrator and nobody will take me seriously. And that's that's the point of our friend in chat here. So, so yeah, you know, and then, but I do want to bring one other voice into this conversation, which is from a Microsoft guy, if I can find him. Um, it's down here. I can't find it right now and I'm not, I'll let you guys find it. Go through and search through this. There's some good, good opinions on this. Um, but the, the, sort of counter opinion of this is turned out to be related to um, someone who was using the terms, who was taking you know, exception with the term software engineer. So software engineer is where we get, it gets sticky. And by the way, that term came from a woman at, who worked at NASA who felt that she wanted to add weight to her software developer position. And so she started calling herself a software engineer. It's kind of an interesting story. And you know, very, very talented, uh, capable NASA person. Um, and you get to be careful too, because like some mechanical and chemical engineers and stuff, they, they did, they just do not like that software. People call themselves engineers, but it's becoming more of a thing these days, particularly if you're just coding in Java and you're just making apps, that's not really software engineering, but it's become the term. So I, even on my own documentation, I have senior software engineer. It's a pretty standard term for, uh, what you're going to look for and higher so this this um i believe it was microsoft i don't remember at the moment and it's not as important as the point i guess but they were saying that an engineer does need more certification and that follows that if you're an ops engineer or a systems engineer or a software engineer that yeah you might need a certification but they agreed um at the end that 
it was really the term that they were disagreeing with and not the nature of the learning. So, um, in this, or the certification. So when they, when Gail accepted software developers, she's like, you know, okay, well, let's, let's switch the terminology software developer. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And they both agreed really soft on that, you know, um, software en network engineer. And they're both like, Oh no, no, no. That's one thing where, yeah, you probably do need engineering. So they pretty much agreed, um, with what I'm sort of illustrating here. And, and so when you're trying to decide whether you need a certification, first of all, you should ask, does this career need a certification period? Linux system administrator, DevOps, SRE, um, you know, or will, or, or would it benefit from it because I'm young or I'm trying to break into the industry and I've been a teacher and I want to get in. Yeah, sure. Or I'm really, really young. So the, um, new caller effort from the P tech colleges for IBM, Jenny Romney, who Jenny Romney, who founded the IBM initiative that the K through 16 initiative, which has 16 year olds getting jobs both within IBM and elsewhere immediately. Well, they're, they're stacked with certificates by the time that they get out. And the same goes for WGU, which I'll just plug right now. Um, I do not have anything to do with these guys. Um, other than maybe you want to get a master's here sometime, wgu.whoops.edu. And this is a, this is a mostly online, uh, it's very, it's accredited, it's very trusted. Um, it's, it was just been ranked the number one best um, deal in education for a very long time. Um, depending on the degree you want to get, so cybersecurity, let's say, um, this is, this is something you might want to look at. I'll do, I do a full video on WGU. In fact, I think I already did one. Um, and getting a cybersecurity uh, degree from an organization like WGU remotely makes a lot of sense because it includes all the cost of certification for free and you're not penalized for finishing the program early. So that you pay a, a set amount and you can get through it really fast. Why am I telling you about this? Because this is being a teacher, anything, anything that, that finds itself on the certification end of the spectrum actually plays very well to to this kind of thing of like, you know, getting a career because you can prove your skills. In fact, they even have a certificate that's kind of in the green. They're called certified website developer. You learn HTML and CSS. That's it. Now that's, if you can't prove that, you know, HTML and CSS <laughs> from your portfolio, you know, but, but WGU is heavy on the certificates because they are a remote program. You do get a mentor, but they're a remote program. So they, re they really depend on this, this point that our friend was making in chat that you really need to prove your stuff. And a lot of people are, are, are changing careers or breaking in. So, um, I hope that that has covered the certification question so you can help evaluate whether you really need one. Um, traditionally it is broken into two shops, apps and ops. In fact, uh, at the local college here, Davidson College, they have a SOC and a NOC. The SOC is the Software Operations Center, and the NOC is the Network Operations Center. And that's, you know, that's all the operations. And IT is traditionally divided into those two parts, and, and you could make the case that DevOps is, you know, both is the industry and the um, methodology for connecting the two and keeping them, you know, singing kumbaya and working well together. <laughs> and stuff so it's like you know, how does this software stuff get deployed to the you know to the operations center i wish i still had the um i threw it away but viable one of our chat members gave me the there's a there's a picture of a girl with, in front of a burning house and it said oh my job's done that's ops problem now because they had just finished their software it's a it's an age-old um a conflict actually and and there's lots of jokes about something called the bastard operator from hell bmfh because they would have to say is your is your software worthy and I'll, I'll probably do a video on 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 that cultural thing at some point it's pretty fun actually um and it's probably related more to devops so we'll go into that because devops aspires to squelch that fire and make that work but why do you care because if you tend to gravitate towards software the number one thing you should be doing is, 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 is learning languages and producing things with those languages while you learn them. Don't wait till you learn a language. Don't ever read an entire book and then go do it. Do the stuff, experiment while you're doing it, and then get involved. Read people's code, go get it on a team for open source, prove to, to everyone, the world, that you can be a software developer. 
And frankly, you don't need a certificate if you can do that. I know that because I got people who just got jobs at 16 who were doing that very thing. They proved it through their, through their, what they had done. And they could talk about what they had done with great, with great excitement and enthusiasm in their voice. So that was very convincing. If you're going into cybersecurity, uh, not, that's a really solid, or a network engineer, you definitely want to just do nothing more than get the certificates. You probably want to get an A plus and then get the network ones. Or and I, I do a whole I'm gonna do a whole video on what I how the path to cybersecurity engineer, senior cybersecurity. I'm not one. I did work in indirectly with security as a systems um, sort of system software developer and wrote protocols for collecting data and audit data at IBM. So I can speak to that from that perspective. But the certification for for uh, for different um, security uh, operations kinds of things is something I would definitely get a certificate for. And I can talk about the ones that I, that I know are required. Um, this goes back to WGU. They have certificates that they have, you know, collaborated with the government on and uh, certifications that are not required that are particularly valuable in the industry, such as OSCP. So these are all topics I'll cover um, in other uh, streams or other chats. And, um, but back to, this question here. Um, so I, this has been a long video, but that's okay. You can chop it if you don't want to go on. But I now want to talk about some of the negative aspect of certi certification. So this is where you can end if you don't want to hear things go negative. Um, certification has become a complete racket. Uh, there are people who, who provide certifications who have no business providing it. And one of the biggest offenders of this is, is CompTIA, the biggest one in the world. Um, uh, lawsuit against um, right to repair. So this has been in the news this this month recently. This is what Febu February two thousand twenty. And I I won't. Uh, oh wow, Comptia! This is new information. When did this come? Eight days ago. Oh oh, this is great. Okay, so to give you the background here. This is super interesting. I'm, I didn't know about this. Um, CompTIA very hit the news big time because the CompTIA, which is one of the companies that gives you A plus and Network Plus and Linux Plus and a lot of required certifications for different organizations, particularly the government, require A plus if you want to be in Department of Defense. Um, they start went about on a on a lobbying spree with local governments, asking them to go to vote against the right to repair, which was shutting down small time repairmen and people who wanted to just work on iPhones and stuff. And there they were arguing that they had no right to do that, that it was insecure and that it, our, our country was less secure for, her, and that um, ultimately we would be worse off without a lot of people who received their certification. Now there's a surprise. <laughs> right and this really really pissed a lot of people off technologists there's people boycotting comp TA certificates you know people were suggesting i throw my book out the window i you know i'm always always hated certificates i'm just going to tell you because nine times out of ten the certificate is not testing your knowledge and in the case of CompTIA, let's just give you an example, Linux Plus. You have to take like a 60 question multiple choice test down in a testing center that's like Fort Knox. And you have to pay your money no matter what. You don't get a retake, that's it. And one of the other reasons to go to WG, by the way, is you get two retakes for free. So, you know, after that, by the way, you're done. Apparently you can never take the test again and you're out of the program. So you better make sure you're ready to take those. Now I'm I'm a guy kind of guy who horribly really just tests horribly. I just I am a hands-on guy. I'm constantly practically inclined, and I'm very thorough. So I take a long time to accomplish anything. So um, for me, this is you know I'm not a CompTIA guy, certifications guy. So I'm already kind of against it as it is because it's not testing you. Now the offensive security, for example, though that organization has certificates where you have to have a connection to their virtual private network, their VPN, and you work on actual systems. You break in and they, they give you a challenge and you have to finish the challenge within 24 hours. That's the way I believe certification should be measured. That is a measure of your skill. And you can probably think back to a movie or two where someone had to prove their skill and they had to do some outstanding feat in front of everyone and prove it. They didn't sit down and answer a theoretical like question and you know for multiple choice quiz on whether on on their skills they actually had to do them, and I've had um, uh, a respectable um, 
leader and teacher at a community college in the network side, um, bring in candidates for networking and, and put them in front of some things and work on it who were, had received their certificates and they couldn't do anything. So they had to say, I'm sorry, no, you need to go actually get some experience. So I just want to tell you that because if you can prove you can do something, um, even with stuff that lends itself more to certification, that will always be better. It will always be better to have actual experience. And that means setting up a mail server in your house for fun, which I did. Um, or, you know, running Kubernetes in your house for fun and putting and putting Minecraft servers on there. Or rebuilding your own computer. Or, you know, installing Linux seven different times with all the different operating systems and practicing. These things get you experience, whether or not you certify. And the 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 first person who certified uh, for Linux Essentials actually did that. He was, uh, you know, the kind of kid who played around a lot with stuff, and he went down and aced his his um, you know his, his Linux Essentials. So there's other things. LPIC is a little bit harder, but my point is, experience is always going to win out. So don't think that you can go through the A plus book and be, the A plus book is pretty funny because when you're reading through it, you're like okay, well, do this and this and this. They're telling you what all the sockets and all the, you know, what serial is and all that jazz. And you're like, it's all pictures of computers where if you don't even have a computer to work on, you're kind of messed up. And so I've, I've made a, I've made a good point of, of that here is about, I have a lab with a bunch of stuff you can play with. It's very Montessori. Montessori, you know, you take a thing out and you experiment and you play and you learn through experience. Well, that's kind of what I have here looking around. I have a bunch of stuff, you know, electronics and computers and everything and people can just take it and mess with it and then learn hands-on and then when the tests come up they're much easier you still have to do some reading and theory but most of it is is hands-on so get yourself some hands-on access um so let's talk about so comp TIA. so this this it's really great to hear that comp TIA stopped lobbying because uh, thanks to online pressure and i want to believe that that came about through um through Louis Grossman, yeah, he was he was the one in the video, so you should get, he gets all the credit. So, but this is part of my, I suppose, disillusionment with certification in general, is that it's a racket. I mean, it is a real racket. The CISSP, there's a real funny. God, I wish I could find. I think that it might even be in the Cora thing. I think this thread, the Cora thread, where is it? I think it has somebody chimes in who got their CISSP for it's a security certification. Uh, it's largely on the executive side. And she mentioned that she just she just knows she has to go pay her three hundred dollars every two years or something. And it's just part of the ritual. And she just has to plan on it. Nothing's changed, but she has to do it every time. And so you get stuff that's in the gray area where people are pushing, saying, hey, you should really certify. And and by the way, you should pay us for the certification. And the person's like, I can I have overwhelming experience demonstrating my skills. Why are you making me do this every time? But you would never be OK with an EMT saying, why are you making me certify in CPR every year? Right. So it's an ongoing debate. But unfortunately, there's this level of greed and corruption in the certification industry because it's a racket. They have a total monopoly, CIA in particular. So so they, they make all the rules. This is the same problem as the SAT tests and the ACT. They're all run by the same groups and they all suck, but they have all the power. And so they make it happen. Um, and so that's, that's where I view certifications kind of negatively. Um, however, and that's why I don't have one, because to be quite honest, I'm like, I would rather work five times as hard to prove with my own like, you want to come, you want to come down to my place? I'll show you the lab where I built my own, you know, this and this and this. I mean, and I'm so convinced and, and try to be, I've never needed to do that. Of course, all the jobs I've applied for, they were more traditional. So they, they, they hired you based on your experience. In fact, the first job I got, I, I listed on my resume, you know, set up virtual machines, automated through Apache server for 256 virtual machines or so, something like that. And um, the interviewer who is um, going to be my boss asked me point blank, did you do this? And I said, absolutely. You want to see the Perl code? It was the 90s. <laughs> but he's like, because that was what he wanted. And there's a number of lessons involved in that story that I'll tell another day. But the, the number one lesson from the story was I had a specific, you know, demonstrable, measurable results on my resume that could be validated. Um, so, you know, there you go.
That's my that's that's my take on certificates. Yes, they help you. Um, but then there's one other negative part about certificates that I want to talk about before we leave this topic. People who rely on certificates to hire you are lazy. Most of the time, they're lazy. Now, if it's a lawyer, yeah, they want to make sure you pass the bar and you've got you know all the things in place to prove that you know what you're doing. But there, I have experienced this, and I, I've helped do some hiring, and um, you know, none of the people that I was working with, thank God, were these kind of people. But I have definitely got the sense that there are hiring people in the industry who are so desperate to get help that they will grab a certificate, somebody with a certificate, and they'll stick them in the door. And I know this because I know of one specific case where, by the way, this guy was later taken away by the... Um, For many people, the certificates are an excuse. Well, I hired him and they had an MCSP. And so if they do badly, you can say, well, look, I didn't look, he has an MCSP on his thing. It's not my fault that I hired a bad guy. He's a bad guy. He lied about his certificate or the certificate program is crap. They measured him incorrectly. It has nothing to do with me, the hiring manager. That's my main point of a disagreement. If you're hiring somebody, your job is to make sure they're going to work on the team. It's not to freak them out in front of a, of a whiteboard or it's not to look at the right letters on their resume. It's to examine their experience and examine how they do on the job and hire them based on that and have the confidence to back it up because you witnessed it and to take responsibility for your recommendation for this person coming into your company. And I've seen the opposite of that. I've seen, I've seen one kid make it all the way in a kid. I'll say he's the one who was taken by the FBI. He put MCSP on his resume and I, somebody decided to call him out on it. So they called it and they looked at it and after actually have, have it. And after he'd already been hired, they asked him point blank, you told us you have MCSP on your resume. And it was like, it was a stamp. It wasn't even like a letters. And he said, I didn't say I ever had one. <laughs> that actually happened. It's no surprise that this guy was taken away by the FBI for freaking and for stealing credit card money. I wish I had been there on that day. I wish anything I'd been there on that day. Um, so, you know, just these are, I, I'm sorry I'm ending on a negative tone, but, but when you go into this certification game, just know, keep, have your eyes wide open. Make sure someone's not taking advantage of you. There's nothing like giving somebody a piece of paper and making them feel like they've done something you know, that false validation and they, and they go out and the thing that's really insidious about this is that people actually think they know it. I really, really hate this about clubs. Free code camp's guilty of this too. They give you a nice certificate at the end of your, of your web development thing. I tested 40 people. None of them could make a web page from beginning to end, not a single one. So, you know, what was wrong? Was it the system? Was it me? Was it them? I deliberately didn't help. I helped them after that, of course. There's no repetition. That was the problem. So just go into it with your eyes open. Uh, it can be a great thing. It can also be a very bad thing. And be informed. Read this Read this Quora article uh, if you can find it. And um, I'm happy to answer questions. So I'm going to read here. It says, um, I really don't like to think that putting time limits on things like that is a good idea because most people can't perform while being watched under pressure. And actually, I'm glad you brought that up because I actually believe that this is illegal and is just yet to be tested in court. There are certain people on the spectrum of which I work with many. uh, um, And there, there are certain psychological conditions that legally you're not required to disclose, but that would be put on test if you were to stick them in front of a whiteboard they would collapse but they're some of your best hires and the most brilliant by the way to give ibm kudos on this ibm is really well versed in dealing with these type of people um and they have um over the years my i don't have a lot of specific references most of it's anecdotal but i just get the sense they've been around them so they know what to do for example they don't like open floor plan for god's sake <laughs> you know um the nicest recruiter experiments I've had when they let me work with the team for a week. Then they decided if I were a good candidate or not. That is exactly, exactly, God, you're like my favorite person today. <laughs> that is exactly what should be done. 
And I actually told that to a hiring manager or somebody at Google. It wasn't a hiring manager. And they said, well, unfortunately, not everybody can fly out for a week or a month from their current country or location to be tested. And that's unfortunate. That's true, right? So if you want to hire somebody internationally and you, you want to test them out and you don't have something there in their region, what do you do? Do you pay the money to fly them out and then pay? I think it would still be cheaper than a bad hire. You cannot guarantee a good hire better than bringing someone saying, you have two weeks to perform, show us what you got. And it's all on our dime and we'll, we'll pay for you to be here. I think the, the these companies, the big ones in particular, who have the money to do that kind of thing would be, it would be in their best interest to do so. And they would have other relatively modest versions of screening. And then, you know, not the whiteboard thing. And then, and then go and then see how they work with the team. There's so many things you need to test about this person besides whether they can answer how to jump out of a blunder. So, um, yeah, that prevents you from recruiting anyone that isn't cap cap compatible. Right. And I completely agree. You can have somebody who's a total, total match on paper and they just don't work with your team dynamic. And I, we had to deal with this with one person at IBM, unfortunately, and I, I don't want to get into detail. It was kind of negative. Um, we had to remove him. And I, I know of another person who I, I can't talk about who had somebody dig them, their roots they are called technocrats. And they'd really dug themselves into the organization so that they were indispensable and everything would collapse without them. And they did it on purpose. And so, yeah, you want to identify these kind of people. They might be really smart, but you want to identify those, those personal practices uh, to decide if you want to, and they might have a thousand certificates. Who cares? You need the trust, right? You need the trust. And you can't, you can't test trust until you observe them. And that goes for any hire. Steve Jobs and, every, and Bill Gates both said the best thing that they ever did is figure out how to hire the right people. So, you know, be the right people. <laughs> I'll end with that. Be the right people. Make sure if you get a certificate that you work on ways to demonstrate trust and responsibility and all that other jazz. But don't shy away from them if you think it'll help you out. I hope this helps somebody out there. I'm going to sign off for now. Um, I have a session here waiting. And um, so do that, whatever that thing is, like and subscribe if, if you want to hear more.